again. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. If you might be watching us on television, we welcome you as well. We're glad to have you as part of our service this morning. We trust it will be a blessing to you. I want to mention those rituals that we do. If, if you're a first-time visitor here this morning, we would ask if you would please raise your hand so that our ushers might come by and give you some uh, information regarding some details of Central Church. Also, we'd like to ask that you would find that friendship pad that's on the center aisle and shine it and pass it along so that everyone on your pew may sign, and then as it comes back, note the names of those who are sharing a pew with you this morning. We've got quite a few announcements today, and we're going to uh, begin with uh, our minute speaker, Kelly Devine. She's responsible for many of these announcements, and we thought it best if she gave you those announcements herself. So do I get a minute per item? All right. Good morning, Central Church. How are you today? Awesome. Well, I'm going to talk first about a new New Testament. So what is a new New Testament? Well, it's the name of a book featured by Dave Weston during our next adult Sunday school class. Uh, the class will start next Sunday, October 20th at 9.30 in the lounge. So now you're asking, what will I learn from a new New Testament? Well, you will learn that our Christian roots are deeper, more diverse, and more widespread than the general story of how Christianity began. Perhaps more importantly for us as Christians, we can claim a set of new resources for our 21st century lives. A new New Testament opens the door to a wider set of expressions, practices, stories, and teachings than we've ever known before. So I'm hoping maybe, even if you don't typically go to adult Sunday school, that you'll give it a chance, you know, maybe stop by, see what it's all about, and if you like it, you'll stay. <laughs> uh, I also need to talk to you about the Reader's Theater. You may have seen some posters around. Uh, we put up a notice on Friday, October 25th at 7 p.m. on the stage in the back of the sanctuary here, we are going to present a Reader's Theater. Local playwright Shelley Selipak worked with our own Marie King in cooperation with the 175th Anniversary Committee to bring us a very special look at the history of Central United Methodist Church. Our heritage is going to come to life in this enlightening and even humorous at times narrative. The stories will touch our hearts and help us to understand just how far we've come in 175 years. So if you join us for the event, I think you'll really, really have a good time, and it's going to be followed by refreshments. I know that's a surprise too, right? <laughs> okay, so I have a little humor for you, so bear with me. I don't want to hear any groaning out there, all right? I had to combine, I had to find a, a joke that kind of went along with my other two announcements, so this was harder than it, it sounds. Once there were three vampires, no, I'm sorry, three vampire bats. They lived in a cave surrounded by three castles. One night, the bats were challenging each other to see who could drink the most blood. Well, the first bat comes home from his outing. He has a little blood dripping from his fangs, and the other two bats are amazed. They're like, so how did you do? The first bat says, well, you see that castle over there? I bit three people for dinner. So the second bat, he goes out on his nightly outing, and he comes back a little messier than the first bat. The other two bats are astonished. They're like, how did you do? He says, well, you see that castle over there? I bit five people for dinner. Well, then the third bat, you know, he goes out, and he's, he's just trying to measure up to the other two. And, and he says, uh, you know, he goes out, he comes back, and he is a total mess. And the other two bats, they're, they're just looking at him like, how did you do? He says, well, you see that castle over there? And they both nod. He says, well, I didn't. <laughs> there you laugh. Thank you so much for laughing. You guys are too kind. All righty. So I'm going to finish with the announcements now. I have two more. Uh, the first one, it has to do with the blood drive. I'm saying this with it. I'm trying to be a straight face here. 
On Saturday, October 19th, uh, Central's going to sponsor their bi-monthly blood drive in Fellowship Hall from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, if you would like to donate and have a really great breakfast afterwards, maybe a little fellowship, you can do a walk-in. You can call the, I think it's 1-800-RED-CROSS, but check me on that. It's in your bulletin. Um, you can make an appointment. And uh, on Sunday, October 27th, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're going to be hosting our annual Trunk or Treating Neighborhood Event. Now, for those of us who are already all signed up to go, we're going to be dressing up, decorating, and opening the trunks of our cars in the back parking lot of Central out here. And the intention is to offer a safe place for the neighborhood families to bring their children for some treats and maybe even a few tricks. I'm looking for people right now to bring their decorated vehicles and provide treats for our guests so the kids can go around the perimeter of the parking lot. Um, the sign-up sheet is outside of the church office, so if you want to sign up, uh, and bring your trunk, dress up yourself, you know, kind of be a little entertaining. If you absolutely can't make it that day, but you want to participate, we're looking for people to donate bags of candy so that if maybe somebody wants to bring their trunk and they don't really, you know, can't afford the candy, you guys can work together. Uh, the candy can be dropped off in my office, the education office, or leave it with Pat at the desk anytime. Uh, either way, I would really, really like to see the parking lot full, and we're going to do a couple little things with the kids for fun on the 27th. So that is Sunday, October 27th from 4 to 6 p.m. Sign up ahead of time, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Wrapping up with just three more small announcements. As you may have seen coming into the sanctuary this morning at the the uh, Welcome Center, we're, we're uh, encouraging you to purchase the uh, tickets for the dinner for Central's 175th anniversary celebration. And we're also encouraging you to uh, consider purchasing a keepsake Christmas tree ornament, which uh, is also in celebration of Central's 175th anniversary. As you can see, it's finished in a, in a sandy mist with an onyx imprint of Central United Methodist Church text, the image of the church, and then the dates, 1838 to 2013. Perhaps a keepsake that would have significant meaning to your, your family and perhaps others that you know who have left the area but who still had a warm connection with Central. Today also in the dining room is uh, your last opportunity to put a bid in on that silent auction of the uh, uh, photographs that were taken in the course of the summertime study, Where Do You See God? That uh, silent auction will be concluding sh soon after our service this morning does uh, end, so that uh, if you do want to put in a bid or see how, if your bid has been overwritten yet, head down there as, right after the service. And finally, uh, we want you to be sure that you knew that next Sunday, October 20th is going to be Laity Sunday. It's a tradition in the Methodist Church that on Laity Sunday, the laity basically uh, asks the pastor to step aside, and so that laity have been responsible for planning and uh, executing the service. In particular, Sarah Hungerford, who is our lay member to annual conference, will be bringing the message next Sunday morning. From the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1, 4 through 7, we find our first reading this morning. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people, whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I, to whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf 
for it is in its welfare you will find your welfare. Lord of wondrous patience, the earth has risen again, emerging from a darkness in a way it has never quite been before, whirling to a fresh time and unused space, alive with trembling possibilities and us with it. Such staggering grace, please. Nurture us in newness, set us free from the tyrannies of habit and complaining and blaming. Shake from us the dusty melancholy of too much success and comfort, pride and pretense, that as if it was on the first day of creation, we might begin to see the miracle of life and humanity, to hear the hum of grace unfolding to meet all our needs, unexpected surprising, and urging us to go on in faith to whatever is next in love. Indeed, we want to show your love to the world. We know there are so many in need this day, those who are sick in body, those with troubled minds, those facing difficult, intractable situations. We've named some before you. We pray for Wilma, for David, for Helen, for Evelyn, for Anne and Esther, Stacy, Jan, Sylvia. Special prayers for the families of Charlie and for Mary's family as they adjust to the loss of their loved ones. We know that the needs are great, and we are grateful that your grace is even greater that indeed joy can come. As we go forth in concern and service, may it be your message of love and grace that we bring, that all might feel the joy of life as it unfolds. Doris and others who celebrate the arrival of another year. Be with all persons, no matter where they may be, O God, who need your blessing and your grace. And may the service that we render help to make it real and alive. We dare to pray these in all things in the name of your gift to us, Christ our Lord, who left us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second, our second scripture reading this morning comes from the second book of Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8 to 15, and it's found in the Pew Bible and the New Testament on page 212. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel, for which I, have, I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus the eternal, with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. May God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of our scriptures this morning. Well, this is our final day with uh, Timothy and Jeremiah uh, as well. We've been following these two on sort of parallel tracks for the past couple of weeks. We'll wrap them up today. Then 
Next week, as Jim mentioned earlier, is Laity Sunday. Lay leader Kevin Cristelli and lay member to conference Sarah Hungerford have been working on this service. Uh, Laity Sunday has been around the United Methodist Church for a long time as a way to remind us of the gifts and the strengths that laity bring to a congregation. Uh, you could have uh, the best pastor going, but if the laity aren't there and aren't offering what they have to give, the church isn't going to go anywhere. So we haven't celebrated or recognized Laity Sunday in quite this way uh, at Central for some time, so I'm looking forward to it. And not just because it gives me another week off. Now, <laughs> although, I'll tell you, I was thinking, um, last month we had United Methodist Women's Sunday in September. I didn't have anything to do that whole week. Uh, this coming, you know, Sunday, Laity Sunday, October. So I'm looking for ideas for November and December. So if you have anything, <laughs> let me know. Then after Laity Sunday, I'm going to begin a series on the windows, the symbolism and the signs in our uh, windows here in the sanctuary and the overflow area in the back. In my first appointment, more years ago than I care to remember, uh, some years prior to me, one of the, the great pastors of the former Wyoming Conference, uh, Bill Highfield, had done a series on their windows and I heard that over and over and over again, what he had done. And I, I finally figured out what they were saying. I took the hint, and I did a series on the windows, uh, which I know was not nearly as, as well done as his, but it was, it was fun to do. And I got thinking it would be uh, interesting to do that here at Central as well. So that's where we'll be going after Laity Sunday. And that brings us to the very end of Kingdom Tide, which puts us at Advent and looking ahead to Christmas. So the calendar isn't slowing down for any of us. It's moving right along, but uh, a lot of good Sundays between now and then. Shall we pray? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, again, our recent focus has been on the letters of Timothy against the backdrop of Jeremiah. How the advice and counsel of Paul, or whoever it was who wrote Timothy, uh, has echoed the trials and tribulations of Jeremiah's day. And then what that means for us Christians today. And I realized this past week that I didn't set the proper historical, geographical uh, context, if you will, of Jeremiah. I had a discussion after the service last week with someone about my lack of appreciation for history through the years, which I think was rooted in my high school experience. I had basically two history teachers in high school. One was a woman who, at the time, I thought was quite old. I suspect now she wasn't as old as I, as I thought she was. But she was boring and as dry as dust. Honest to Pete, I think she stayed up every night and tried to figure out how she could make history more boring and more dull than it, than it would be otherwise. Then the other history teacher after her was the junior varsity basketball coach. And so all it took, particularly in basketball season, was to say, so coach, what did you think of the game last night? Well, that was the end of history until it came time for the test, and then he and we realized that he hadn't taught us anything. So it was a pretty unhappy uh, experience. Only in seminary, only after I got in seminary, did I realize that if I understood history and if I understood geography, the Bible would make a whole lot more sense. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Things happen for a reason, and they happen where they happen for reasons. And so I gained, a, again, a greater appreciation for history and geography. So I think about it a lot more than I used to. Ancient Babylonia, what's being discussed in Jeremiah, is in the area of modern-day Iraq. 
you recall discussion about the Fertile Crescent, Tigris and Euphrates rivers and so forth, called the Fertile Crescent, I now understand, years after high school, because much of the Mideast is actually dry, desert, hard, scrabble land. It's pretty much worthless. Well, it was in biblical times because they didn't know about oil, petroleum, and even if they did, they wouldn't have been able to use it. So it's, it's worth something now because of the oil. But prior to that, there, there's really just a whole lot of desert. So Babylonia had a decided advantage with these two large key rivers flowing through it and then coming together within its boundaries. The city of Babylon is, was about 53 miles south of what is current day Baghdad. The gate of God, the gateway of the God is what Babylon means. And then Israel, Jerusalem, they were important not so much because of what was there, because again, there wasn't a whole lot, but because of its location along the coast where there was lots of commerce and people wanting to go north to south didn't want to go very far inland, and so Israel became a very popular uh, spot for people moving from, from place to place, which is what made it so valuable. So at this point in the Jeremiah narrative now, Babylonia has overrun Israel. We've seen it coming for a couple of weeks. It's now happened. Jerusalem's in foreign hands. It's under foreign control. The people of Israel have lost hearth and home. Anything precious, anything of value was gone. And as if that wasn't bad enough, some of the leaders of Israel and some of the people of means, people with money and power and influence and so forth, had been carried off into Babylonia, into exile. It was a way of, of kind of keeping things under control back home because the movers and shakers were now gone. So some people were, if you will, stuck at home in, uh, in Israel and in Jerusalem, and others had been carried off, and they were stuck in Babylonia. Either way. It was like being in a foreign and an unfamiliar place. Anything and everything familiar and reassuring had been taken away. You were either living in a foreign city or you were living in your own city under foreign control. It was a bleak, bleak scene with little future and little hope in sight. And what does God say to Jeremiah? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Get married. Have children. Have your children have children. In other words, live, live life to the fullest. And then, then, whether you're in the foreign city or you're in your own city surrounded by all these foreigners, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find welfare. You can't shape your own destiny. You're under foreign control. There are many... Uh, the people around you are, are foreigners, if you will. They're not like you. You may be strangers in a strange land, but God says, care for them. Care for people wherever I've sent you. Now, all this is coming through Jeru uh, Jeremiah, the prophet. Remember that prophet here doesn't mean fortune teller. He's not going to tell you what lottery number to play or, or who's going to win the, uh, the baseball you know, league championships. But prophet here means God speaker, speaking on God's behalf. And on God's behalf, Jeremiah says, look, God has given us this time, this place, this life, and this community. Let's live our lives and live them well. And to do that, we must, we must care for the people around us, even if they are not like us. And in caring for the least and the lost, 
we are caring for ourselves. That was Jeremiah. Centuries later, centuries later, Paul, or whoever, was writing Timothy, the, the letters, echoes the same theme. We may be suffering hardships. We may be feeling chained, if you will. We may be feeling held down and held back, but the Word of God is not chained. And so we are to remain faithful. We are not to wrangle with words. Interesting. We're not going to go down this little side trail today, but don't wrangle with words. Don't get all caught up in doctrine and nuance, but present yourselves to God as best you can. We should be as faithful as we can, rightly explaining the word of truth and living as fully as we can. Wherever we are, whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we are to remain faithful to God, and God will remain faithful to us. Now, that's not startling news, I agree. That's not the most innovative point to bring up in a sermon, but nonetheless, every now and then, we need to be reminded of that. The parallels between Jeremiah and Timothy, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the people of Israel in Jeremiah's day were under foreign control, almost like aliens in their own land. The people of Israel in Timothy's day were under the control of the Roman government. Now, they got to live in their own land, but they had to live according to these secular, non-religious rules and regulations and laws. There are some parallels with us today. Now, we, as individuals, we may not have invading Babylonians breathing down our neck about to take over our homes. But we all have problems, and we all have troubles. And some of us, some of us have way more than our share, way more. And there may be times when these problems pressing in on us make us feel like there is an invading horde that is just coming. We may at times feel like we're in the walled city of Jerusalem, watching trouble, watching disaster coming our way, and feeling like there is little to nothing we can do about it. There may be times when we feel like the people of Jeremiah's day. We today, as church people, we may, we may not be living in a land under foreign control. I know we're loath to admit it, but the county government in Binghamton, the state government in Albany, the federal government in Washington, D.C., they're not foreign. They are ours. They're ours. We have a vote, and we do vote. Most of us, I think, do. And then the votes are counted, and we win, we lose, or we draw. We're happy sometimes and we're unhappy at other times. But they're still ours. But the point is that even in our own land, there may be times we feel like we are strangers in a strange land. Some years ago, uh, one of our university professors, a guy named Stanley Hauerwas, wrote a book called Resident Aliens, Life in the Christian Colony. And basically, he's talking about, yes, we're living in our own country, but there are times that we as Christians feel like we are aliens. It's no secret that not everyone in our land believes or feels or even wants to live as we do. And that's okay, isn't it? That's the definition of freedom, that we can live as we prefer to live. And though I'm a pastor, I certainly don't want religious leaders determining how we all ought to live. Because there are a whole lot of different religions and different beliefs, and even within the Christian community, there's a broad, broad spectrum. And I've seen some of the rules and some of the laws that some of these so-called religious would enact. And I don't like them. They are frightening. 
I don't think we want a theocracy, a nation that's based on religion. Well, unless I'm making the rules, then that would be fine. If I could make the rules, I'd be very happy with that. But we have what we have. And uh, some people say it was Winston Churchill who first said, our form of government, democracy, is the worst form of government there is, except for all the others. So, like the people of Jeremiah's day, like the people of Timothy's day, we often find ourselves in times and places where it's very difficult to live our faith. The, the stuff in our personal lives is often against us. The culture is often against us. Yet th there are these principles that we, because of our religious faith, our belief, we believe it makes us a better people, safer, stronger, and happier. And our call is to live those out and to witness to them in the hope, in the prayer, that by the example of our lives, others will want to live as we do, according to God's love and grace. Even if they don't uh, worship or give devotion to God, the way we do. They might want to adopt those principles. And so, we want to live as those who, as says in, the, uh, in Timothy, those who are approved by God. Those who having received from God gifts of unconditional love and grace and acceptance and promise and hope, and the list goes on and on and on. In gratitude then, and with gratefulness. We live by those principles. We joyfully receive others as God has received us. We want to live as did those in Jeremiah's day, to seek the welfare of the city where God has sent us at this particular moment in time and space. And we pray to God on behalf of the city because we know that in its welfare is our welfare. A city, of course, is a technical term. It stands for community. It stands for state. It stands for nation. We could even argue it stands for the world in which we live. And our call is to witness to the good of all in the city, not just the fit and the fortunate, the well-positioned and the well-heeled. Our call is to witness to the good of all in the city, including the least and the lost and the lonely, those cast aside as undeserving and unworthy, because we know, or we believe, our lives bear witness to the holy truth that all are worthy, that all are deserving, and not because of our own merit or theirs, but because of God's unceasing, unrighteousness, Lenting, constant, continual, ongoing grace. And when we live out those truths, then we are truly living as those approved by God so that those who don't know or maybe aren't sure, those who think the gates and the doors are close to them will come to see that the gates are unlocked and the doors are open and the circles of God's gracious, inclusive love are getting wider and wider and wider, like ripples on a pond. Oh yeah, God may not like everything we do, nor approve of every choice we make, but God does approve of the holy and the divine that is in each of us in this room. And God does approve of the holy and the divine that is in each person not in this room. And that's the message we take as we go. That's the message we take with us as we are sent out in Jesus' name. That's the message we take as we go with ready hands because it is indeed our work to do, to make the world one of love and justice and peace. May we go not alone, but with each other, grace of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in the company of Christ our Lord. Let us pray. 
for the gifts that you give us and the way that you empower us and send us forth, O God, we give you thanks. In gratitude and gratefulness for all that you have given us, we dedicate our lives in concern and service to all of those whom you have already approved. In the name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.